The presence of spirit ashes has been a hotbed of quarrels and unnecessary arguments in the forum since the very day of launch, to a, a, about about five people. The rest of us don't really care and just don't use them, or we just use them for low-level challenge runs. But if this channel being alive for 12 years is proof of anything, it's that complaining about things on the internet is very profitable. Which unfortunately means both I and these weirdos are here to stay for a long time. The shoddy companion AI also means some people may have different experiences with different ashes, which is probably gonna make this video's comment section very interesting. There's no real system here, at least not one that's as rigorous as usual, but I'm still gonna try anyway. Ugh, you you, uh, uh, who wants to talk about War Thunder? War Thunder is a vehicle combat game that features over 2,000 tanks, aircrafts, helicopters, and ships with a dynamic combat flow that encourages the player to use various terrains and combat approaches to your tactical advantage. There's zero reason this game should have this much vehicle customization, but I'm very thankful for it. Even the individual parts of the vehicles are modeled after real vehicle components, and these same components actually take damage individually when you're being gunned down by someone. It's a really small detail that most people probably won't even notice or care about, but if you're someone that cares about historical accuracy in games, then it's something you'll appreciate. The customization options make it to where each vehicle you own ends up feeling like a personal extension of you. You can do anything from painting camouflages and historical insignias all the way to, like, actual three-dimensional decorations you can just throw onto your tank. You also have a really helpful damage x-ray feature that shows you exactly which parts of your vehicle and crew took the brunt of an impact. The PvP battles in War Thunder have very various measures of immersion, meaning if you aren't a huge history buff and you're just looking to feel all the excitement as immediately as possible, you can just pop into a quick match and start heat-seeking fuckers with your favorite anti-air tank. War Thunder is free to play on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox, and newcomers to the game, and those who have been inactive for at least six months, can even claim a large bonus pack with multiple premium vehicles and decorations using my link in the description and pinned comment right now. Number 64, The Noble Sorcerer. He's got everything a bad summon needs. No HP, very little mobility, if at all. One spell with extremely limited range and power. An item description that literally explains how much he sucks at everything. And an even worse melee attack that can be prompted by enemies just being near him at any given time. He will flat out refuse to fight enemies if they're too big. Like, he just shits his pants and does nothing. Dude, you have a spell! What's there to be afraid of? Why are you running away from the dragon? Just wave your stupid stick or whatever and expel Yamas' ass. But as an additional negative, just to make sure he's really not good doing his job. The AI of this Spirit Ash is legendarily incapable. I swear to god I've been in the middle of boss fights before and I'll just see this guy in a corner firing pebbles into a fucking wall. Number 63, the Nomad. Against bosses, the Nomad is the luckiest summon in the world if he manages to attack so much as once. He has barely any HP and no means of mobility, which are the two worst traits I think you're able to even give a summon, but that's not even the crux of it. What's amazing to me is that he specifically found some way to actually make Frenzy Flame look bad. Getting him anywhere earlier than right outside the goddamn door of the hero's grave you emerge from is the only way he could be sort of useful. But instead, we find him near the underground roadside grace hanging out in the sewers in the fourth legacy dungeon of the game, all but guaranteeing his uselessness. Number 62, the Miranda Sprout. Well, why does the existence of this spirit ash feel like a germa bit that accidentally got shoved into the game? Like, I I'm not kidding, seriously. Who looks at an enemy like this and decides this could be a summon, can barely move, only fights by dealing status, vulnerable to fire damage, which is not an uncommon utility even on basic enemies, and summoning them costs 185 HP. Do you have any idea what a massive difference that makes in the early game? I'm sorry, is the item description really telling me to take Take care of them. A giant troll is currently trying to recharge his magic sword using the whole of my ass as a power outlet. And you think I'm equipped to start a babysitting service right now. Number 61, the Claymen. You know what? No, no. You guys start attacking whenever you feel like it. No, it's okay. Really. I'm sorry for being impatient. Being a take unit is more than just poise for the boys. You need an HP pool to actually take punishment and be given an opportunity to met it out. Being able to take one hit's worth of HP renders any poise you have completely useless. That's that's kind of how HP works. There's so much missed potential here for a great tank summon, but we aren't given any spear units or close range reinforcement. Just two of what's probably the least productive variant of Clayman you can find. Number 60, the Winged Misbegotten. Airborne Spirit Ashes are among the mightiest, simply because they're able to take advantage of an entire axis of movement that most others just aren't able to. This Spirit Ash completely squanders that benefit by hovering in the air completely still and getting his entire bone 
bone structure shattered within a single hit. This ash is a never-ending cycle of getting swatted out of the air, taking 30 seconds just to pick your ass back up only to get spiked into the floor again by something else. Repeat until death. Number 59, the Glintstone Sorcerer. I'm starting to come to the conclusion that single summon spirit ashes, unless they're of the legendary or named variety, just aren't worth the trouble of upgrading them. Someone who specifically excel in ranged or melee, rather than being a little of both, obviously means they'll only be able to adequately perform in a small number of environments. But in the situations they do perform, you'd at least expect them to be, I don't know, capable? This guy fires one spell, and it's not even the good version of it. This might be a crazy suggestion moving forward, but I feel like with sorcerer types, upgrading their spirit summons should give them access to more powerful spells. Nothing too fancy, I'm not asking for the valedictorian of Raya Lucaria to start belching supermoons at his face, but d d give me star shower on a plus 10, Th that's not a huge ask. Number 58, the Archers. Just a horrible summon. I can't find a single fight these guys perform well in. They're shit against dragons, they're hopeless against Crucible Knights, and the application of Frostbite is only relevant if the incredibly slow arrows actually manage to connect on something. Look at this shit! I have this guy walking in a straight line with the Archers directly behind me, and all three of them still missed! I don't think they need more health, I don't even think they need to cost less FP. I honestly think the only adjustment you'd need to make here is just up the projection projectile speed a little bit. If they can proc frostbite once, they've done their job, but that almost never happens unless you go out of your way to aggro something and somehow trick its AI into being as still as possible. They're okay against magma worms. They're, they're very okay. That's the only positive bullet point I have for them. Number 57, the Mad Pumpkin. Getting this ash to work feels like driving a car with two missing wheels and inverted controls. He probably can do damage, he's probably a threat to something, but that something is never what you'd like it to be. You're trying to fight Melania or something, and he's busy baby raging in the corner flattening anthills with his massive bitch head. I'm, I'm sorry, do you, do you know where the boss is? Honest question. Bleed builds actually play to your detriment here because blood loss in his vicinity renders him as useless as cement toothpaste for a good 15 seconds. And even if his HP starts getting tolerable when fully upgraded, the way he fights is just never worth 110 FP investment. Number 56, the Soul Jars of Fortune. In addition to the iconography resembling a really shitty action movie from the late 2000s, the summons themselves are exactly as involved in combat as you think they are, which is barely at all. Look, I respect the enthusiasm. I respect the pun that just makes it sound like someone paid for a Kickstarter tier that lets you name a spirit, but summoning a pack of cheerleaders in this game has no tangible value. All it's gonna do is make me feel slightly happier when I defeat something. That's it. Number 55, Finger Maiden Theralina, a fully dedicated through and through support summon who only uses healing incantations and throws holy water pots. This is not an idea that's doomed from the start, but this is also why everyone would rather just equip Mimic Tier with support utility items and then switch their loadout at the last second while the boss menacingly walks towards you for two minutes. It's because this summon is one of the only other options. Agile builds centered around dodging will have to constantly try not to roll out of range of her heals at the last second and having no reliable ways to draw aggro puts you in this really awkward position of having no choice but to literally put her in danger by playing near her when you want healed. Support utility spirit ashes are something I think most of us like the idea of, but I think we should be advocating for better companion AI first, because that's the single flaw that kills any utility for this summon, and convincing yourself that she would fuck you if she were real is sadly not going to change that. Number 54, the Skeletal Bandit. The respawning utility is nice and all, but it's it's time to face reality. The damage drop-off from the mid-game onwards is so noticeably, incomprehensibly thick on the skeletal ashes that they are essentially demoted to decoys by the time you get to Altus. The gimmick of respawning becomes a mere inconvenience for dragons, faster bosses, pretty much anyone with an AoE, and if they have to fight around certain attacks that involve a sort of lingering damage like magma, they're, they're fucked. They're just fucked. Anyone that can string together melee combos runs the risk of accidentally catching this guy on the backswing while he's still trying to get up, and then just bam, there goes the entire gimmick. Shame too, because it looks like this guy has great damage. He never really stays alive long enough for me to verify that, but it sure looks like it. Number 53, the Albanorix. They're a wonderful meme summon if you can tolerate their sheer absence of productive behavior, but only if you think cartwheeling through magma and into a corner and taking 500 damage from something is the pinnacle of humor. What they lack in intelligent decision making and offense power, they make up for in personality and mobility, which as I'm writing it, I've just noticed is a very roundabout way of saying, these guys really fucking suck, but I'm afraid that if I'm too mean to them, someone Someone's gonna throw a tantrum about it and hand me an essay I don't feel like reading. 
Number 52, the Landell Soldiers. There's a multi-spirit summon for each legacy dungeon and an additional mausoleum summon, each of which have their own specialty. Radon Soldiers can use fire damage and are a bit more aggressive with melee tactics. Rhea Lucaria Soldiers have access to magic ranged damage via those annoying shit rocks everyone throws at you. And Landell Soldiers try very, very hard to be a tank utility, but sadly end up nothing more than just a pair of chuckle fucks with oversized baking sheets and slightly more HP. Running up to someone and thrust a great shield in front of their face is a tactic reserved for those with a bit more muscle, like Crucible Knights. It's not a strat the average Joe with a barrel chest can just force into working, but but god do they try. It makes them decent meat shields if nothing else, but I wouldn't expect them to pull any actual weight. Number 51, the page. All right, I've delayed this long enough. Help me understand. Someone, please help me understand whether or not I'm looking at this the wrong way. This isn't a bit. There's always one section on every single list that I know people are going to start divvying themselves into factions over. And for this video, I, I feel like it's the page. A few people hate this guy way too much, and a lot more seem to pine over him like he's a 25-year-old college professor's assistant in a dating sim. He is not that great. His shots miss half the time on almost completely completely stationary targets, he'll time a dodge slightly wrong and get hit by the same projectile he tried to avoid, and I don't know what once in a million glitch I unluckily stumbled into here, but in this footage, he straight up just stops fighting the fucking boss. Like they worked the same shift at a Wendy's five years ago and suddenly recognized each other. What is this? What is happening? Number 50, the Jar White Puppet. He would probably pull a ton more weight if his status pots were actually thrown with a bit of strategy, but my best guess is that his AI reads the area you're in and then throws pots according to the resources that are easiest to obtain in that area. I summoned him against Makar and he threw Volcano Pots and Poison Pots, two of Makar's strongest resistances, and so, giving him the benefit of the doubt, I went over to Borealis to summon him and he just starts throwing ice pots. Like, what? what's your fucking problem? Number 49, the Wandering Nobles. Five meat shields airdropped directly to your location. They're slightly faster, have slightly more HP, and take slightly more than a second or two to completely be erased from existence. They get stomped by dragons, they get impaled by knights and sentinels, and they're just all around not good at anything. Nothing I'm saying should even be surprising here. They're a single step above sentient bread loaf, and some of them don't even have weapons. Number 48, the Spirit Jellyfish. Her shortcomings aren't immediately apparent in early game fights like Margit and Leonine Misbegotten, where everything gets stomped by the common cold, but unfortunately get past a certain progress point, and her AI, magically, by sheer coincidence, just happens to become much stupider, and the summon simply forgets that she is, in fact, a ranged support. So, you know, maybe stop tap dancing between the fucking black flame pillars like you're a black knife. I'm not sure why this happens, maybe it has to do with the arenas becoming a bit more constructive strained when fighting certain bosses, but I'm convinced most people who swear by her just want her to be better than she is because of her side quest. Number 47, the Fire Monk. I think this particular spirit just needs a slight boost to everything he has in his kit. His flame incantations and mace swings both seem to do barely not enough damage to, to be worth a solid investment. His HP and poise pool are just shallow enough to make him feel like he constantly gets flinched out of everything even though he really doesn't, and the need for incredibly small adjustments eventually add up over time to where he just isn't outstanding in any way. He's not even entertainingly bad. He doesn't cartwheel off cliffs or try to pocket heal a fucking older, he, he just, he just isn't good. Number 46, the Rotten Stray. This Spirit Ash is your one way into and out of Stormvale without the need to invest in a single level. If this dog can inflict rot so much as once, whatever he's chomping at is pretty much guaranteed to die in like the next two minutes. He trivializes both Margit and Godric, not because his DPS and health are sustainable, no no, certainly not because of that, but because you are literally just not supposed to have anything to do with Scarlet Rot until much later on in the journey. The game just isn't prepared for you to make the decision to venture towards Kaled, even though the spirit summon is right on the fringe of Limgrave anyways, and it's just guarded by two shitty pit bulls. Number 45, Lone Wolves. Three Lone Wolf spirits. Th three of them. Three lonely-ass fucking wolves with absolutely no company whatsoever. And they don't even evolve into the bigger ones at plus 10. Not sure why they would've, but there's no rule anywhere saying they can't, so I'm going to complain about it. If they can actually get near a boss without tripping over a crate or getting flinched by a random projectile, their damage is actually quite nice. And I'm only sorry that the comically low HP pool nearly completely offsets that utility. They're good for what they are, and what they are is below average. 
Number 44, the Fanged Imps. Like most Spirit Ashes, you're just about required to pull aggro off of them every other time you're able to, just to give them more than 10 seconds of screen time. Status Ashes are nice, and some of them are capable enough to even stand a chance against entire bosses by themselves, but the HP pool of the Fanged Imps are so astronomically small that flicking it on the nose runs the risk of erasing it from time and space. They have some really great qualities that shine through during the earlier parts of the journey, but get completely eclipsed by their shortcomings not even a couple areas in. Number 43, Battle Mage Hughes. Does anyone actually know what this guy's strength is supposed to be? Firstly, excelling in magic damage isn't exactly ideal for a spirit summon, but his whole kit just seems to pepper everything on the combat stake without any clear focus in a particular department. He's a little ranged magic here, a little melee bonk there, with a special hidden melee as like a sidearm last resort or something, and all the little proficiencies here and there just add up to one big semi-capable mess. The one utility I found was that his cannon sorcery and big bonk can flinch crucible knights, apparently, but that's just because I got lucky and decided this section needed b-roll of him fighting a crucible knight for like no reason. And he still gets his face punched out through his ass in like 15 seconds, so it barely even matters. Number 42, Putrid Corpses. Well, I expected exactly zero benefits here, so the fact that they were even capable of surviving for more than two seconds means these guys might deserve at least a small forbearance. It's literally their job to simply stand in a single spot and accumulate attention. And with over 10,000 HP per spirit at plus 10, they keep it for a long goddamn time. Most servants of the order tell you there's room for the vile and profane in their doctrine, but if you're ugly enough, people who serve the order will just find reasons to beat the shit out of you, making this one of the only lore-accurate spirit ashes in the whole game. Number 41, the Oracle Envoys. The FP cost isn't doing it too many favors on the surface. I can throw out like 5 Karian Piercers for 72 FP. They can exploit holy weaknesses in bosses, but that's not exactly a dense population of folks. Against larger enemies like dragons, they actually stand a bit more of a chance than most would probably think, but they tend to stick together most of the time, which renders them vulnerable to massive AoE attacks. It always feels awkward using these guys because although the damage is pretty consistent, you're never too sure how long they'll last in the fight. One of them could claw their way to the finish line by getting lucky and having his walk cycle get stuck on a large rock, but they could also decide to stick their face in fire breath and get erased in a single swoop. Don't expect anything outstanding, but the tracking on their bubbles does make them able to take the spotlight of you pretty often. Number 40, Demi? Demi humans? Okay, I'm not sure if a patch note got released that just didn't sit with them right, or if I've just become a much less tolerant person since the last Spirit Ashes video I did, but I can never get as much mileage out of my Demi human summons as I used to. Even the larger spirits get their kneecaps busted with every other hit, and it seems like nowadays the only particular talent they really have is holding the attention when they have it. Getting it is a different story altogether in most situations, but once they've attracted the ire of someone, it becomes noticeably hard for them them to lose it. Summon them at night and they enter baby rage ass mad mode like a wooden spoon broke off in their ass and enjoy their heightened aggression. That also gets them killed that much quicker. Number 39, Skeletal Militiamen. Honestly, the only reason I'm giving this Ash a much higher spot than the Bandit is because at least there's two of them. And surprisingly, they almost never die in the same spot either, so at least one of them is guaranteed to respawn and survive for like another few seconds, giving you a chance to appreciate their actually not bad damage. Number 38, the Halig Tree Soldiers. This Soldier Spirit Ash is my least favorite, personally, specifically because they sacrificed themselves at around half HP, which is a threshold that I think should just be lowered either to a quarter or just as a death condition altogether. But even I can understand they aren't just for entertainment. They also throw poison pots as an additional utility, and they can actually inflict poison pretty reliably just by doing that. Just don't do what I did in this footage and absentmindedly summon them against the Rot Kindred, because they have that effect where they get like a 20% attack boost by puffing their own farts or something. It takes a lot of effort to make holy damage look decent, and these guys d don't don't exactly do that, but we're getting close. Number 37, the Vulgar Militia. Not great against groups, despite being a group themselves, but their saws can inflict significant bleed buildup on enemies who are susceptible to it. Like most other summons, they require a bit of teamwork to stay alive, and by teamwork I mean you getting off your ass and getting your hands a little dirty. They have very little survivability by themselves, but if they can proc bleed more than one or two times in a single big target, that's a successful summon in my book. Their jumping attacks can enable them to hop over ground crawling attacks every so often, making them an ideal match for dual 
duelists, misbegotten, and other forgettable encounters. No one really summons anything for it anyways. Look, I'm trying really hard to sell these guys here, but they aren't giving me much to work with outside of, oh look, bleed status. Number 36, Godric Soldiers. This pair of dumb, brick-headed shithammers occupy the middlest of middles. The exact definition of average, mid, C-tier, whatever you can find in a thesaurus. Pay no mind that they're occupying the 36th slot on the list. I've just, I've just decided half of 64 is no longer what it is. One has a sword, one has a hammer. They show up to earn their pay, and once they've done exactly enough work, they they just clock out and dare you to ask anything more. They are okay at every single aspect of this game's combat. They sometimes hold aggro, they sometimes get in good damage, they sometimes survive more than 20 seconds or so in any given fight. I saw one of them face tank an entire mouthful of poison from a gargoyle without catching anything deadly, but the damage he took was so absurdly high that it didn't even matter. Perfectly balanced in my opinion. Number 35, the Kaiden Sellsword. The Kaiden requires a bit of distraction to actually keep him alive for a significant amount of time, which to an extent is true for most Spirit Ashes, thus the, the point of Spirit Ashes. But this summon is a bit of a special case where his utility is ultimately determined by whether or not he's currently getting pissed on by something. He's a hyper-aggressive spirit that benefits from a second threat fighting alongside him and adding in some damage. But once he's on his own, that exact approach is what gets him pretty consistently erased in a short time. He's also really weak against DOT effects like lava pools and projectiles that stay active for a while, like lightning damage damage when in water, or black flame pillars, making him very unideal for ancient dragons, magma worms, godskins, just the most annoying roster of bosses you can think of. Number 34, Avianet Soldiers. Their ability to apply bleed buildup immediately saves them from being anywhere in like the bottom 10 or 12, but a few of their smaller benefits also aren't immediately obvious. The bleed they inflict with each hit is minor at best, but they somewhat make up for it with a high APM when they enter their malfunction mode and start imitating a Beyblade. Wow, wonder what the the next chapter in Rusty's writing course will be. Man, I hope he covers how to accurately compare things with sharp edges that spin a lot to Beyblades or Blenders for the 29th time. The fire pots are a nice touch. They reset frostbite! And they're a nice pair of ashes to have in your pocket during your expedition through Kaled. Number 33, the Kindred of Rot. They're about as annoying to bosses as they are to you when fighting them. But the first thing you'll notice is a significant deficit in the stopping power of their Pest Threads ability. It's to be expected on a Spirit Summon, and in hindsight, anything being that powerful on a Spirit Ash is kind of just a stupid assumption to make. But this actually makes them not that great at managing larger bosses. They can tank a Stomp or two from Dragons, I'll give them that much. But they seem to be yet another case of an otherwise incredible summon that just gets bottlenecked by their AI deciding they're late to an appointment for getting their skin removed. Good when used alongside a poison build, though. Number 32, Rhea Lucaria Soldiers. Maybe if you actually used your damn claymore every once in a while, you'd get some bitches on your dick. What? I don't even see you use the sword half the time, and when you do, it's never used as aggressively as your fire-themed brothers-in-law. You just throw cuckoo glintstones at everything. Seriously, what the fuck is that great sword even there for? Maybe the trolls had him on toothpick duty. What's even more surprising is the amount of damage and aggro you can get out of the two-foot soldiers is very surprising. Their HP might as well be represented by a red square, but those little fuckers know how to dance. They can keep up decently well with black knives and red wolves, and at plus 10, their HP pools finally get spacious enough to not melt immediately. Number 31, the Man Serpent. The lingering lava makes him extremely good against dragons and big bosses that aren't equipped to get out of its range. Urtree avatars and clean rot knights also get mulched pretty easily. Not to mention the whip that bypasses a portion of guarding defenses. But unfortunately, this little guy comes up short literally everywhere else. His HP pool is way too negligent to even think about his support in the later parts of the game, and unless he's able to actually finish his magma pool ability without someone flinching him out of it, he's bored line useless. However, on those uncommon instances where he goes to work, you barely even have to look at your screen. Number 30, Perfumer Trisha. Aside from giving you a free sample of depression on tap with her item description, Trisha is probably the only support theme dash that's actually competent enough to be called good. Kind of. Her spark aromatic does damage comparable to getting slapped by a small puppy, and that's further exacerbated when going against bosses with high base fire defense. Her value is instead demonstrated through various perfumer-themed buffs she can give to the player, most notably the uplifting aromatic that she casts immediately upon being summoned, and will continue to cast intermittently so long as you keep her alive. Even so, she can still be a little stubborn regarding when she decides to fling it out, but she also comes equipped with an attack-boosting perfume she'll use every so often. Keep her alive and she'll make your new game plus runs slightly easier. 
Number 29, the Twin Sage Sorcerer. I need to make myself as clear as possible here. The Twin Sage Summon is a close to mid-range melt DPS wearing the disguise of a long-range sorcerer. I was hoping to see a little shard spiral action, but I guess that would have been asking too much. But at least he can cast a variety of two different sorceries. And the only sorcerer who can do that so far is Hughes, so the competition looks pretty dry. The magic tickling from afar doesn't really matter. GGS is only one half of his kit, and it's the one half worth ignoring. His crystal burst sorcery, however, is just mean. It's practically cyberbullying. I now understand the purpose of GGS being the primary sorcery on this spirit ash, because if it were the other way around, there would be no need for any other magic damage summon. That shit can push past the thousand mark in point blank damage. Do you have any idea how rare that is on a summon? Number 28, Giant Rats. You remember playing for the first time and complaining about how tanky the rats were for like no good reason? And then nothing changed and we sort of just accepted that Elden Ring's rodents were going to be on PCP for the rest of our lives? The caveat here is that with the power of spirit summoning, you can harness power identical to this by just summoning rats to come and stun lock everyone for three minutes. This is also the only spirit ash I'm aware of that has zero FP or HP cost to their name. So they could literally stand in a single spot with frozen AI and the Aggro they would just naturally pull from enemies around them would still be a net positive. Honestly, that's the only good thing about this summons, but it's a pretty massive benefit. Otherwise, what positives could there possibly be? They're, they're just fucking rats. They don't die immediately, and they're surprisingly really effective at handling groups. Asking anything more of them at that point is just selfish. Number 27, the Marionette Soldiers. One particularly amusing strength of theirs is that their bullet spam can very easily trap faster enemies in a never-ending loop of dodging and evading nothing for as long as the Marionettes continue firing, rendering their movement extremely predictable and, in certain hilarious cases, unable to attack. However, their malfunctioning modes are a bit bothersome when triggered, simply because they require consistent accuracy to really be of any use. So summoning them a good distance away from what you intend on them hitting is usually a solid enough way to prevent this from happening too often. They're pretty effective against most big lumbering bosses and enemies who are brain dead enough to walk slowly towards you in convenient single file, and that's a longer list of enemies than I think most people expect. Number 26, the Azula Beastmen. Another summon with a jammed up performance for no other reason than you getting them way too late into the game for it to ever matter. It's not uncommon for the game to place tools and items and whatnot around the area that precedes a big boss with the expectation that you'll use them on said boss, so curiously I tried them against Malekith, and well, they, they didn't do terribly, but expectations started sinking lower once I retroactively tried them out against slightly earlier bosses and didn't see much difference in their performance. They do have an edge against Banished Knight, due to their weakness against lightning, but it seemed like they just showed up to the Nile fight half asleep. But they also performed pretty competently against those I wouldn't have expected. They pushed Morgoth all the way into his second phase without any help, but even now I'm not completely sure whether or not this was a fluke. This results in one of the most confusing and inconsistent spirit ashes I think the game ever gives you. If you can keep them alive, they'll almost always do enough work to be considered good, but there's little practical reason you should get this as late as it's offered. Number 25, Night Maiden and Swordstress Puppets. The only puppets in the story who actually became puppets of their own volition. But there's more to these two sisters than just being an ethical dilemma. The Swordstress has an impressive amount of range, and the Night Maiden employs a Night Mist similar to the character's sorcery, only no one else except the enemy gets hit by it. The high FP investment can dissuade people from bringing them out too often, plus they have some poise-related weaknesses that can make them suffer against bosses with high aggression and damage. And I'm also not crazy about the length of time it takes for them to actually become aggressive, like the kill shit command is being thrown into an action queue that's constantly behind schedule, but I promise you, when they take off, everyone else is just fucked. Watching these two mercilessly shit on an entire mob of enemies is like watching a pack of velociraptors eat their lunch. It's amazing. Number 24, the depraved perfumer Carman. This dude is honestly full of surprises. The fact that he has two heals in his pocket makes him extremely durable. His ability to dodge in between throwing out his spark air allows him to avoid damage to the point where he can even keep up with black knives by himself. If the Night Maidens are Velociraptors, the depraved perfumer is more like a, a shitty ostrich. Much faster and still able to tank an astonishing amount of punishment, but a little lacking in the damage department. The utility in his spark aromatic really comes from its hang time, potentially enabling enemies to run into the perfume a couple seconds after it's been thrown, in addition to a poison aromatic he intermittently uses. I slept on this guy for a long time just because I assumed 
assumed he didn't come with the full package you usually see on enemy perfumers of the same variety, so consider this a warning against making that same mistake. Number 23, the land squirts. Wait. These, th th these things have souls? As in, they're alive? Wow, I'm suddenly very depressed. If you can tolerate their mentally unwell spawn position choices, these pus buckets can end up being some of the greatest tank summons in the game. Sometimes. The benefits given by these spirit ashes will ultimately be decided by where they decide to spawn, and they tend to choose an ideal location most of the time. It's just that every so often they'll make the decision to dock themselves near the fringe of a cliffside or something, massively downsizing your ability to fight next to them. Sometimes they may spawn so far away that they just end up despawning after a few seconds and completely ruin your chance to summon anything. I did nothing wrong. But they're a continuous source of high status. They almost killed Morgoth by themselves when I tested them, and when they do manage to work, they demand respect. Number 22, Dolor as the Sleeping Arrow. I summoned her to fight Makar, and she slept him three times in about 30 seconds. Status summons aren't as widely respected as Steamroller Spirits like Tish and Rolo, but status build up this high and this consistent is completely squandered if you aren't paying attention to her. These aren't just normal run-of-the-mill arrows made of curly straws and chloroform. These are Saint Trina's arrows. 96 fucking sleep per shot, making her an invaluable asset versus most dragons, crows, trolls, any any godskin boss. This makes her one of the few spirit summons available that can reliably hold her own all the way up until the end game. And she's even smart enough not to wake her own targets once they're knocked out. Number 21, Clean Rot Knight Finlay. When she's close to enemies, her Halo Scythe will also score hits during the weapon skill, putting her in a really favorable spot where she's able to apply pressure from afar and slight status at a closer range, although I've never seen her proc bleed a single time without help. She's unfortunately faced with an all too familiar conundrum where, despite being really good in most situations, she's acquired way too late into the game for it to actually mean anything significant. You've probably taken a lot of energy forming a very valuable emotional bond with a lizard or something, and it would be a shame to let all of that go to waste. Finlay is about as thick-skinned as any other named Knight Summon, but her unique buffing ability also increases fire damage negation by 60%, a wonderful help against end-game bosses like the Fire Giant, Moog, and Placidisax. Number 20, Radon Soldiers. Even though these aren't my favorite soldier type summon, they're definitely the most inspirational. This is the pair of dudes they wrote shitty action movies about in the 2000s. The Soldiers wish they had a movie poster that looked this good. The Radon Soldiers are probably the tankiest soldier squad despite not having great shields, and there's only two of them. But hyperaggression not only doesn't put them in awkward spots that get them killed the same way it does most other weaker spirits, but I've seen that great sword topple crucible knights, avatars, and way bigger enemies than it should. That one guy could probably topple a goddamn national monument using nothing but this greatsword. The longsword unit also has the multi-hit charged heavy that most Radon soldiers have, a fire torch, and they both come equipped with fire pots. It's not even that they're that outstanding or anything, I mean they're still a soldier summon, but seeing just two wimpy dudes with a torch and a sword taking down entire bosses by themselves is just a wonderful sight to witness. Number 19, Banished Knight Ingval. The lesser half of the Banished Knight duo, Ingval, gets picked up insanely early on in the journey. He might even be the very first summon you even acquire depending on how you explore Limgrave, which is where a lot of his utility comes from. It barely even matters that he gets poise broken by things like regular soldiers, random AoEs, and tripping over his own goddamn shoelaces every so often. The massive HP pool and decent enough DPS is enough to make sure he stays relevant a great deal into the game. He isn't exactly a dragon slayer, at least not as much as other tank ashes, but most regular enemies and smaller bosses he can deal with just fine. Soldier Soldiers, Warhawks, Chariots, even Revenants and Trolls. There are a few small setbacks that prevent him from being ranked among the strongest, but he is dependable and he always shows up to work. Number 18, Red Main Knight Oga. Oga fits into more of a damage role than a tank. I've seen him get flinched noticeably more frequently by heavier attacks and AoEs that normally would have been brushed off if behind a great shield, should he ever decide to, you know, use it. He's less durable against quicker enemies and requires a bit more teamwork than most legendary ashes to keep alive but his arrows can deal great damage despite not consistently pulling aggro. If you summon him far enough away from the action, he rarely ever moves from his station and just lines up pot shots against whoever you're fighting. It adds up to a lot of extra damage over time, especially considering he doesn't often miss due to the speed of his arrows. I almost wish he either had the bow or the sword and great shield, because bosses that are best fought at mid-range tend to just confuse the AI to the point where he just whips
whips out whatever he wants. Number 17, Latena. It sounds filthy rich saying this about a spirit ash, but she has a bit of a learning curve. And by a learning curve, I mean employing exactly one placement method that just automatically makes her better due to sheer exploitation of terrain. Latena is a ranged summon identical to those annoying Albinoric machine gunners guarding the Ordina Everjail, which is both advantageous and not, if only because she can't move from the spot in which you summon her. Meaning, perching her on a high cliffside that overlooks a boss all but guarantees her safety for a good minute or so. But once she catches someone's attention, keeping her alive by returning the aggro to you suddenly becomes an extremely high priority. It works really great for specific tank playstyles that hold aggro, but she won't perform her best if you aren't willing to take a couple hits yourself. Number 16, Bloodhound Knight Flow. The largest setback with Flow is the surprisingly squishy HP pool, which isn't something I was expecting to be on a boss summon. Usually they're on the tankier side, but Flow has a limit to the amount of punishment he can take. If they're susceptible to bleed, he'll almost always proc it at least once without you needing to defend him. His fast movements enable him to keep up with bosses of similar agility. Nox Monks and Knight Maidens are never a problem, but tankier and bleed resistant bosses like Crucible Knights and large lumbering idiots like Avatars and Godric can flatten him pretty quickly. General rule of thumb for Flo is, if it bleeds, he can kill it. Probably. But this is also Spirit Ashes we're talking about, so if he can get someone to even bleed once, then that's usually more than enough to say he's pulling some good weight. Number 15, Mausoleum Soldiers. I'm starting to gaslight myself into thinking the parameters for these ashes and the demi-humans got shadow swapped at some point. I do not ever remember these guys being this good, but having five of them at once is a benefit no other soldier summons give you, and the difference is both seen and felt in the matter of like two seconds. They instantly zero in on someone the second they're summoned, start attacking, and just don't stop. The squad includes two claymore units, which are key in flinching bigger enemies, while the other three continue the damage from there, and they can all teleport. This is a machine that's well-oiled to perfection, a hurricane of vandalism relentlessly spiraling towards the first person that insults their clothes. These benefits can even carry over to larger enemies, only their distinct lack of a great shield unit handicaps them a bit in terms of survivability. But watching these guys push a sanguine noble up against the wall and just bury his ass is so entertaining that I, I forget to even care. Number 14, Ancient Dragon Knight Kristoff. Kristoff runs like old people fuck, but the lack of mobility is offset by the fact that he actively uses a great shield, making him one of the most durable summons. His spear comes with a thunderbolt ash that's just as good as yours, minus the damage, turning most fights into this mildly entertaining tug of war where the boss doesn't know who to aggro on first. The damage isn't quite there, but the flat lightning damage buff provided by the thunderbolt skill is enough to make up for the deficit. He'll take aggro, and he'll lock that aggro into a chokehold until until something kills him. This fucker put Godefroy away, and I only wish we could summon him inside his Everjail to test out how he would perform against him. Oh, wait a minute, we can! We can just mod that shit in here, watch this. Number 13, the Ancestral Follower. The Follower Summon is a ranged tank. Not only does that sound awkward as hell, but it, it actually is. The range on his bow is among one of the longest bullets in the game, leaving him in a very advantageous position when far back enough to capitalize on it. By the time most bosses give enough of a shit about the guy in the corner shooting glow sticks into their face and start walking over to him, he's already lined up and fired two or three more shots. The ranged damage rivals Oga's great bow, and honestly, in certain situations, seems to even surpass it. The melee moveset is just nice enough to keep him from being completely defenseless, but the ideal position is still very, very far away from everything else, which gets really annoying when he begins shuffling around for a bit and ends up sacrificing a strategic position. Number 12, Banished Knight Oleg. The HP pool between him and Inval is practically identical, but Oleg ends up lasting longer and feeling more durable because his agility allows him to escape damage much easier. He can single-handedly force magma worms into their second phase, he solos most dungeon bosses at plus 10, and anything that isn't a giant dragon, he basically just fucking poops on. Being a much more active summon means he's also more likely to come to your rescue if something is applying pressure on you, which was something I'd noticed him doing multiple times. His performance is mixed against other hardy enemies like Grave Duelists, as the key to his melee spam sandwich is ultimately whether or not his targets remain flinched. But with 8500 HP at plus 10, he's not a summon that just calls it quits after a few seconds. Shit, he'll probably be standing right next to you when the fight's done. 
Number 11, the Warhawk. If you are an average size knight or rat or flower or whatever, most attacks will just sail right under the legs of this summon. I'm pretty sure the downward talon slash leading into the flame burst is a true combo on smaller enemies because I haven't seen a single enemy that's able to escape it. Not only can it take advantage of verticality, but it's also really fucking small and really fucking fast. I swear to God, nothing can hit this bird. There are just so many times where attacks from enemies very obviously look like they connected, but they just don't somehow. He doesn't even have that much health, but his survivability is so goddamn strong thanks to everything else that it's hard to even notice the small HP pool. Number 10, Black Flame Amon. Black Flame attacks scale off of max HP, which means Amon stands a good chance against pretty much anybody. This also makes him good even against godskins and other fire resistant enemies. That flame blade is hot ass like a cooked diaper when we use it, but it's a goddamn force of nature in the hands of a Black Flame monk. The poise on both monk summons are actually pretty impressive, but you notice it more on the Black Flame variant because of how damaging the triple spin slash is against literally anything. Seriously, nothing can stop that attack. Scouring Black Flame also pierces through targets, which is invaluable versus dragons because his incantations can potentially hit multiple times. Number 9, Nefeli Lu. Nefeli, Dung Eater, Mimic Tear, these summons are all among the greatest, and what makes them great is that they are NPC summons. Just having a second you with your moveset, speed, and potential toolkit running around getting everyone's attention without the game scaling adjusting to accommodate two players in any way might as well be the easy mode everyone has been asking for. Nefeli is the weakest of the three, but she's still a great example. Power stancing axes can grind your enemy's knees into a fine powder, the Stormhawk Axe unique skill is basically just a better Stormcaller that gives you a lightning buff afterwards, but the cost of acquiring this puppet is still way too damn high. The emotional burden of reading that item description after knowing full well what the fuck I just did, it, it's just not worth the trauma. Number 8, the Crystallion. Massive poise, massive survivability, and he's even stronger against any physical damage that isn't strike damage. He has probably the single worst DPS of any solo summon unit, and he runs the risk of spinning into a ravine or off a platform half the time, but when you see a Spirit Ash with the anime protagonist plot armor sized poise of 350, you don't ask questions. You pick it up, you thank the game for giving it to you, and then you shut your fucking mouth. His attacks don't even connect half the time, and this Jolly Rancher looking fuck can still put down entire bosses by himself. This weirdo eats black knives for breakfast. It'll take him like 10 minutes, but he can do it. So long as no one in your vicinity has a strike weapon, the Crystallion will outlive any other threat on the screen by a frighteningly large margin. When nuclear winter takes us all, this popsicle right here will be the planet's most dominant species, and no one will be able to so much as breathe without his say-so. Number 7, the Great Shield Soldiers. These cookie sheet wielding psychos have stuck with me through thick and thin. And to those who have summoned these guys in a pinch, you understand how easily it is to flat out just fall in love with them at first sight. This is what the Landell soldiers wish they were. The lower HP per unit can trick players into thinking they aren't worth the investment, but this is one of the incredibly few instances where I get to compliment the Spirit Ash AI for being slightly capable. As hard as it is to believe, these guys will actually shield. They will block shit with their great shields. Are you fucking kidding me? Slap a single buffing spell on them like Golden Vow and they'll practically ruin the game for you. 10 out of 10. Number 6, Stormhawk Dean. <laughs> the summon for people who don't like summons. He begins the fight by boosting all your physical damage. All of it. Even ranged physical damage from arrows, rock sling, stone of goddamn garank, and he even increases poise damage similarly to roar and cry related weapon skills. It barely costs any FP, the buff is strong enough for him to be useful in any part of the game, and you almost never notice the HP shortage because of how fucking good he is at just dodging everything. Just keep him away from AoE attacks and he, he should be fine. Number 5, Dung Eater. If he could just get his hands on a plus 10, we would be in business, but I think that's asking a bit too much from a summon. If anything else, he somewhat justifies the Selavust questline, yeah, kinda. He's certainly the only reason I would ever attempt it in a casual playthrough, so I guess that's a light testament to the strength of this summon. He uses the Regal Omen Baron Consumable, which tracks wonderfully onto enemies and even stunlocks some lighter bosses, enabling free hits. But the practical reasons to use this summon versus the Mimic Tier are very little, because you can just dress yourself in the armor and pretend you're the Dung Eater, and the only difference you'll really notice is how much damage you were missing out on by not doing this earlier.
Number 4, Lutel the Headless. Lutel further emphasizes the strength of a teleport ability on a spirit summon. I used to think it was just the quantity of the mausoleum soldiers you're given that enables them to last so long, but I got curious and gave the other soldier summons a bigger quantity as well, and the only difference was slightly more sustained damage. This led me to believe a simple, short-range teleport was in fact the make or break, and Lutel only further proves that point by being the single greatest knight summon, not because she oozes damage or because she keeps aggro or anything, even though she does both of those things very well, but because she is insanely good at closing distance, poking something, and then promptly getting the fuck out. It's no wonder so many people like her. One of the greats in my book. Number 3, Omen Killer Rollo. Rollo was the single most underrated Spirit Ash in a previous video of mine because despite not technically being a legendary summon, he walks and talks like one. He fights like an esports champion who's won way too many Street Fighter tournaments but still attends matches just to showboat around and see how quickly he can make somebody quit. Most bosses should consider themselves lucky if they can so much as get up during the first phase, and he can still proc bleed at least once on giant enemies and dragons without getting knocked around too much. I did take him outside of summon boundaries though, just because I was curious, and it seemed he couldn't even kill a single omen in a normal setting, so uh, his title might just be clickbait, but you're not allowed to summon in this area normally, so it's kind of hard to tell. Number 2, Black Knife Tish. You like spirit ashes that can dodge everything despite having little HP? Well, what if we took that Stormhawk summon and gave it a fucking breastplate and a helmet? And, uh, and a knife. Black Knife Teach has it all for me. Great lore, solos weaker bosses in the game without much effort, and can still hold her own against end gamers like Godfrey or Melania for a good couple minutes before a flag needs to be thrown out and player intervention is required. FP price feels balanced enough, she can dodge, she can take punishment, and her Blade of Death skill gives her a pretty good chance against just about anyone. Teach was literally there on the night of the plot when Godwin was assassinated. There's very little this chick hasn't seen. Highly dependable, fights like a wolf and she's useful every single time you bring her out. And that's pretty cool, but you know what War Thunder has? Planes. Yeah, over 2,000 vehicles in total, to be exact. Does Elden Ring have tanks and planes and shit? Does it give you a free care package if you don't play for six months? A care package that you can find a link to in my description and pinned comment right now? Yeah, huh? Yeah, I thought not. Number one's the Mimic tier. That's, that's number one. It's, it's the Mimic tier. Uh, honestly, if you made it to the end of this video expecting anything else here, fuck you. Fuck you and your whole vitamin deficient family. You know this is good. You already know why this is good. People couldn't shut up about it 10 months ago. I can't shut up about it right now, and everyone is suddenly having a slightly worse day being reminded of its existence. Mimic tier is co-op for bitches and absolutely nothing else. It doesn't need a college thesis explaining why it's good. It's literally another you running around taking hits and killing shit. Of course it's the best summon in the game, why the hell wouldn't it be? Mimic tier being at number one is why people started asking for these to be in reverse order. And I get it, because what's the fucking point? Hey, don't take that mic away from me, I'm not done, pussy. I'll end this video when I fucking feel like it. What, you've never watched a 45 minute long video before? Oh, poor you, you gonna be okay?